This is the landscape lecture series from the City of Greeley. I'm Ruth Quaid. I'm with the City of Greeley Water Conservation Program, and I put this together tonight. It's people, it's, we're going to talk about the People and Pollinators Network and what you could do to help pollinators in your area. Beth Conray is our speaker. At this point, I'm going to stop share and Beth, turn it over to you. Thank you to everybody who has made it tonight. Uh, my name is Beth Conry, and I'm with uh, People and Pollinators Action Network. So uh, Ruth gave you a little bit of a preview of who I am and what I do. And so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more. Um, I am the founder and current chair of People and Pollinators Action Network. I'm also the vice president and the treasurer of the Pollinator Stewardship Council. I'm the past president of the Western Apicultural Society, which is the beekeeping organization that uh, covers uh, Western United States and Western Canada. And uh, I'm also past president of the Colorado State Beekeepers Association. Before that, I was president of the Northern Colorado Beekeepers Association. And then I own a um, apiary, okay, a honey business called Bee Squared Apiaries. And uh, so, what is the point of telling you all that? The point is, is that I am buggy. And in particular, I am pollinatory. And so, uh, so I have um, a lot of interest and a lot of uh, time that I've spent working with uh, honeybees in particular, but pollinators of all sorts. Um, who is People and Pollinators Action Network? Well, like I said, I was one of the founders of it and we did this in 2014. And the basic goals were to improve public health and to bend Colorado's natural environment. And the way we decided to do that was through uh, pesticide education, um, science-based pesticide education, as well as improving pollinator habitat. Uh, our actual mission statement is this monster thing right here. Uh, basically the part that I uh, added the bold to is, um, that we are the only organization that does the work that we do. And uh, we get a lot of stuff done. I'll, I'll go through what we've accomplished and how uh, you guys can help us and how we can help you here in the course of the presentation. Uh, but, um, but as you can see, we've got a pretty um, robust mission statement that, uh, and we, we follow it. So we are doing all of the things that, uh, that we say we are going to do. So what do we do? The gist of that whole paragraph is we work on three things. We work on public policy, we work on creating habitat, and we work on synergizing our efforts with other organizations and uh, including NGOs, individuals, as well as uh, governmental entities. So let's take a look at uh, public policy. Why do we do it? Well, we do it because we are passionate about protecting pollinators and we are passionate about protecting people. Why? Protecting pollinators um, is really all about protecting insects of all sorts. And I'll be the first to admit that with all the troubles in the world between uh, and troubles in this country. I mean, between elections and uh, uh, borders and healthcare and infrastructure and pandemics, P insects are near the bottom of the food chain of both humans and, uh, and uh, lots of other species. But I mean, it's hard for people to get motivated or interested in what insects are doing and how they can help them when they have all of these other things going on. And I absolutely understand that. But if we were to stabilize insect populations, uh, then we would stabilize everything that depends upon insect populations. And there is a whole lot of things that depend on them, including ourselves. Um, an interesting study that came out a couple of years ago was uh, that insect biomass is estimated to have declined 40% of the past 50 years. Biomass, that is a huge number, an absolutely huge number. And, and I used to have a slide in here that had this, this infographic that was just too complicated to really read in a slide format, but it went into all the reasons that this is happening. 
um, from climate change to uh, land uh, acquisition, uh, urban sprawl type issues, uh, pesticide use, uh, agricultural uh, production methodologies, um, uh, invasive species, it goes on and on and on why this happens. But the bottom line out of it is that insects are in trouble. And uh, most people know that bees are in trouble and monarchs are in trouble. And uh, here in Colorado, we have uh, about 950 species of bees. And all of those bees, with the exception of honeybees and bumblebees, are solitary bees. And they act as pollinators for all of our native plants. Um, we have, like I say, great biodiversity in bees here in Colorado, and that great biodiversity is attributable, attributable to our geographic biodiversity. So we have mountains, we've got plains, we've got dry, we've got wetter, uh, we have uh, mesas, we have grasslands, we have pine forests, we have everything in between. So it's just that all these things like to live in all sorts of different places and we offer them that opportunity. The monarch butterfly is a distinctive insect, uh, mostly uh, distinguished in people's minds by the unbelievable monarch migration that occurs on an annual basis from here down to uh, Mexico and Mexico back up again. Uh, this year, the monarch migration for the Western population of monarchs was down to less than 1% of what it was a mere decade ago. It is astounding how sick monarchs are. And, and the primary culprit for monarchs is this class of insecticides here called neonicotinoids. And uh, sorry, I hit the button here, I'm gonna go back. Uh, neonicotinoids or neonics for short, are a class of pesticides that um, has gained great popularity. And it is shown to adversely affect many aspects of monarch reproduction, growth, and behavior at infinitesimal doses. And when I say infinitesimal doses, I mean tenths of parts per billion. So <clears throat> really down there in the into nothing zone. Uh, but they're little insects and they're adversely affected by little things. And we'll talk a little bit more about neonics uh, later on in the uh, presentation. But suffice it to say that you're going to see that word again. And, um, and you'll probably know entirely too much about it if you take a look into the issues associated with them. So uh, protecting people. Well, you know, pesticides are... Um, harmful to human health. Pesticides are everywhere. Um, people use pesticides um, in urban settings. They use them in suburban settings. They use them in agricultural setting. And uh, so you are not really getting away from pesticides in any point in your life. Um, pesticides linger in the environment. They stay in water. They stay in uh, soil, they migrate through water and migrate through soil. So it is um, a really a problem for human health because of the amount that we are exposed to um, and where we are exposed to the mat. Um, there is a uh, general consensus that uh, pesticides are quote unquote safe because the EPA is um, managing them. And if the EPA says it's okay, then they must be. And uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but the EPA is not our friend on this one. And um, the same people that bought, brought you DDT and brought you uh, asbestos and a host of other things uh, brings you pesticides too. And so there are there are a few things I want to note about EPA you know, regulation and testing. And the first thing that um, I want to mention 
is something called a treated article exemption. And a treated article exemption means that you as a consumer can go to your local hardware store and you can buy uh, treated wood with which to make your deck without having to go out and get a pesticide applicator's license. And that makes absolute sense. But the EPA applied the treated article exemption to pesticides that are used as seed coatings, meaning that every single seed in, in certain crops, and in particular corn, soy, and cotton, which comprise somewhere around 180 million acres, is coated with a prophylactic uh, application of a pesticide, generally speaking, a neonicotinoid. And the EPA gave an exemption to that use of the pesticide and says that no, these seeded trees are not pesticides. So the other thing that you need uh, to be aware of with respect to pesticides is that uh, the EPA only tests something called the active ingredient. And so if you were to lift up a pesticide of any sort, and I'm gonna go ahead and use Roundup just because it's in the press all the time, and you would see that uh, the active ingredient in Roundup is uh, something called glyphosate. And that if you read the side label, it says active ingredient X percent, whatever it is, uh, something like two. And then it will say inert ingredients or other ingredients, and that will be 98%. And <clears throat> to think that the rest of those ingredients that are there just for sport is, um, is incorrect. They are there because they are making that active ingredient more damaging to more insects. So they are surfactants, they are uh, wetting agents, they are, there's a million different things that they can be. But the bottom line is, is how those uh, act, other ingredients interact with the active ingredient is not tested. And the best way to see the difference in what happens between those two is to look at the cancer data for glyphosate slash Roundup. So the World Health Organization indicated that Roundup is a probable carcinogen and in particular causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, that that uh, carcinogen is um, a real concern. The EPA put out a contradicting statement that said, no, 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 glyphosate is safe. And so, so they are testing glyphosate and the World Health Organization is testing the finished product that what actually you use as a consumer. And that is the difference between those two data sets. They're both right, but which do you get to use? You get to use Roundup. And so that distinction is important. And finally, uh, I wanna, uh, I could go on forever on this, but I'm just gonna talk about the third one, which I think has the, another massive impact and is the absence of something called a precautionary principle. And um, we are, uh, the United States does not utilize the precautionary principle. The European Union does. And the precautionary principle says, hey, you can't put it on the market unless you prove it causes no harm. And we operate the other way. We put it on the market and if it causes harm, we try and take it off the market. So we are the guinea pigs in the grand experiment on what's going on with pesticides. And, um, and it's, it's not been an experiment that's yielded very great results. 
So we are starting to see mammalian consequences to pesticide exposure at all levels of human development uh, in many of our, um, you know, in cancers, in um, uh, some of our, uh, I wanna say, I'm trying to think of the word, but, uh, you know, very uh, endocrine disruptors, all sorts of different ways that things come through um, onto human health issues. And I'm not gonna go into any of that, but if anybody is in need of any of that human health data, feel free to, to reach out to me and I will be happy to provide you that information. Likewise on pollinator health data, okay? So we know that we've got these issues and we know that it's, it's something needs to be done about it. So what are we trying to do about it? Well, this is what we've accomplished uh, since 2014. And I wanna say, uh, backtrack just a little bit to say we are small but mighty. And so there are not um, that many of us. I would say uh, all in all, we probably have a hundred of us, but the core board and, and group is, is about a dozen of us. So we have gotten a lot done and uh, it's with, you know, we get by with a little help from our friends. So uh, the first thing we, we tackled was something called the PAC, which is the Pesticide Advisory Committee. Uh, this is the committee that advises uh, the Colorado Department of Agriculture with respect to pesticides. And um, we were able to, uh, uh, during the Sunset Review of the Pesticide Applicators Act, which is the PAA, we were able to increase um, representation from groups that hadn't previously been represented. So uh, we were able to get a beekeeper onto the advisory committee. We were able to get an organic farmer onto the advisory committee. So we were able to increase uh, the perspectives onto that uh, advisory committee. <clears throat> then we were also able to get a database with respect uh, to enforcement and what the CDA does for complaints uh, that uh, put that information up onto their website so that we could uh, keep track of that information as, as uh, citizens. We uh, were able to sponsor uh, legislation uh, and this was actually a, a bipartisan unanimous piece of legislation uh, I want to say this passed in 2017, but maybe I think 2018 is more accurate. And that was the establishment of the Colorado Pollinator Highway. The Colorado Pollinator Highway is I-76 from Julesburg down into uh, Arvada. And um, we have some test plots that we worked with CDOT and a host of volunteers putting in um, pollinator plantings. Uh, we started up at that uh, northeast corner and are working our way back down. Uh, so that's kind of cool because one of the things that we have figured out is that pollinators need not just isolated um, pieces of uh, habitat, but joined pieces of habitat and highways make really terrific uh, ways to, to establish entire uh, joined uh, pieces of habitat so that there is literally a pollinator highway uh, that is created. So it allows for more effective migration. Um, there is something that we have called a pollinator resolution. And the pollinator resolution simply asks municipal entities, uh, whether it's county or city governments to um, practice integrated pest management with respect to management of public lands by reducing and or eliminating pesticides from their arsenal, as well as to manage lands for pollinators in terms of both plantings and um, turf management. So several communities have passed these pollinator resolutions. They do not have the impact of a law, but you cannot pass uh, a law with respect to decreasing pesticide use or increase, well, decreasing, you cannot pass anything more restrictive than the state with respect to pesticides because this state has something called preemption. And so we have to make resolutions, which just means that it's advisory 
It does not have the force of law. We also have something called the Pollinator Safe Pledge. And the Pollinator Safe Pledge is essentially the same thing with a lot less verbiage, but that just uh, allows both businesses and individuals to make the pledge to be more pollinator savvy and uh, more pollinator helpful with the management practices in their homes and gardens, as well as on their business properties. And we have several thousand people that have taken uh, these pollinator safe pledge. We have um, the governor, uh, actually uh, Hickenlooper was the first one and now Jared Polis uh, have designated June to be Colorado Pollinator Month for the last uh, several years. And so that was our doing. Uh, we also met with uh, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, to establish a comprehensive pollinator policy for state lands. And currently in the legislature, which is why there's a little asterisk at the end of it, is the Colorado Pollinator License Plate. This would be a special license plate that would provide funding for People in Pollinators Action Network and our pollinator projects, particularly habitat projects. And um, it is currently in session. It made it out of committee with uh, unanimous bipartisan support. So we have high hopes for it, um, but it's hard to say how things are gonna go down. So, so it's, it's not done. It's getting, it's doing. Um, besides policy, we also work on habitat. And of course, uh, even though Colorado Pollinator Highway uh, and all these things are um, policy accomplishments, they are also habitat accomplishments. So again, the Colorado Pollinator Highway, this was uh, with uh, CDOT. Um, establishing pollinator plantings along the I-76 corridor, pollinator resolution, same thing, adopting um, pollinator friendly uh, policies at the municipal level and county level and pollinator safe pledges down at the homeowner and business owner level. And then we uh, work with uh, with uh, several well, cooperative agencies and uh, uh, NGOs and uh, individual businesses to support the transition to organic turf management for municipalities. So um, that's our habitat accomplishments. And then we, um, we collaborate. So uh, we work with uh, state agencies um, to try and get all of these things accomplished, these policy things accomplished. And in addition, we uh, created, um, the Colorado Pollinator Network, which hosts an annual Colorado Pollinator Summit that is typically held the first Thursday in November. Uh, it's been virtual, it was virtual last year, but before that it was in the Botanic Garden and over at the CU campus. Uh, but it uh, brings together- hey, You're getting quiet again, sorry. And well, I'm not doing anything, so I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I'm just sitting here. Um, it almost sounds like it's windy, like there's wind going through the speaker right before yeah. it gets too quiet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, just keep reminding me. I, I don't know what to do about it, but well, uh, it doesn't hurt to tell me, I guess. Um, and then, uh, then we work uh, with the Environmental Health Coalition, and the Environmental Health Coalition is a group of... Uh, a whole group of uh, folks working on all sorts of environmental toxics issues from, uh, from um, uh, I want to say the um, outputs, uh, air quality issues, water quality issues, pollinator issues, human health issues, a whole pile of stuff that uh, uh, are affecting. It's getting quiet again. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, so how can you help? Okay, that's what we're doing. Um, and here's how you can help too. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is stop using pesticides in your own home and on your own property. Uh, I know that you don't use very many, but you need to use none. Um, and there are other ways to manage things. And um, we have a whole ream of suggestions. There's all sorts of things that are available to manage pests if you actually have any. 
but uh, most people are prophylactically applying uh, pesticides just in case they have a problem and that's causing resistance. So stop. Um, if you have pesticides, um, you need to properly dispose of them. And I always think it's funny that we call them a pesticide when they come into our house and toxic waste when they come out of our house. But you need to take it to the toxic waste center of your local landfill and they are able to help you properly dispose of them. On our website, we have uh, something called pollinator safe businesses. These are the businesses that have taken the pollinator safe pledge and uh, you can help by supporting those people. And of course, if we get our pollinator license plate taken care of here in the legislative session, um, you can buy a pollinator license plate. We can talk about food and a lot of people are disconnected from the pollinator issue and the food issue, but the two of them are inextricably linked. So this first point where you buy what you eat and you eat what you buy has a lot to do with food waste. And in this country, more than 40% of our production never makes it from the farm to the fork and it is lost in the field, it's lost in transportation, it's lost when you buy it and don't eat it and throw it out. And if you look at it from a pollinator health standpoint, if you produce 40% less food because you're not throwing it away, then you're also using 40% less pesticides. So think about that and be careful with what you buy and then eat what you buy. Buy organic and or local food, okay? What is organic food? It is food that's grown without pesticides. And what is local food? Food that's grown where it doesn't have to be transported uh, for hundreds of miles to get to your local grocery store. So if you can keep transportation costs and all of the associated harms into the environment down, uh, things will be better. You can, of course, grow your own organically, and that's about as local as you can possibly get. Uh, you can plant native plants, you can remove turf. Uh, thank you, Ruth, for Garden in the Box and Life After Turf. What's the name of your project? It's Life After Lawn. Life After Lawn. Yeah, Life After Lawn. What a great name. Uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, you can, uh, you can reduce the amount of turf and hence your amount of water use and plant native plants and you will have a beautiful yard and you will use less water and it will make insects very happy. Uh, and can you, I mention garden in the box are all grown without neonics. Yay. Yes. And there are many, um, uh, in our uh, support the local businesses uh, listing that we have, there are uh, plenty of nurseries that are aware of the issues caused by neonooks and that are also uh, not um, uh, using neonic treated uh, plants. Uh, 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 in fact, most nurseries are that way as long as you're actually going to a nursery instead of like to Home Depot or someplace like that. Uh, if you go to a nursery, the biggest problem that nurseries had is uh, when everything hit the fan on neonics a few years back, you know, all of these plants are in the queue, right? They started trees seven years before that. They started shrubs four years before that. So it took a long time to pull it out of those tree and shrub systems and get them neonic free. And we are starting to see the arrival of those uh, shrubs and trees at this point too. If you do uh, want to keep turf, and even I have some turf, uh, then there are ways to organically manage your lawn and uh, we can help you with that. And then finally, we like to remind people to put their money where their mouth is. So there are lots of people doing, lots of organizations doing really great things. And uh, PPAN is one of them. 
uh, and we'd love your financial support. Uh, we are a member of uh, 1% for the planet. And this year, we will finally have been around for long enough that we will be able to be part of Colorado Gives Day. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and of course, we always need volunteers. You. Okay. How else can you help? Well, you can take the pollinator pledge for your house. You can uh, form a pollinator safe neighborhood in your neighborhood or your HOA. You can have a pollinator safe business. And if you have a business that has a corporate giving plan, I'm gonna give you the contact for our development director at the end of this presentation. Uh, we have lots of people that are becoming very aware of uh, their health and their relationship to the natural world. And so we are starting to see a lot of movement on PPN chapters. And uh, we would love to have Greeley, uh, Evans, uh, Alt, Eaton, every place over there uh, form a chapter um, and work with us uh, to make your uh, side of the corridor uh, as pollinator friendly as you can. Uh, currently we have uh, three uh, chapters. One's Metro Denver. Uh, one is in Boulder County, uh, including uh, Longmont is kind of where they meet mostly. And then the Northern Colorado Fort Collins. Fort Collins uh, started up about a year and a half, two years ago, and Loveland is coming on board right now and joining in with Fort Collins. Uh, so I hope to have some solid policy motion out of those groups. And then finally, encourage your municipality to adopt a pollinator resolution. With all government, um, government listens to citizens. So it doesn't do me any good to go to Greeley because I live in Berthet. And uh, so I had Berthet adopt the pollinator resolution, but we need people to approach their elected officials in the Greeley area to have them approach their elected officials and they will listen to you because you're a citizen and you vote and you vote for them potentially. And I might add to that, they will listen to you as a citizen before they will listen to staff as well. So we don't expect you to do any of that on your own. We have provided services that uh, can help you. I uh, want to let you know that our, our website is currently getting revamped. But we do have uh, a lot of good things on there. They're just not as easy as we would like them to be for you to find. Uh, but we're trying to fix that. So uh, we do have a Colorado specific pollinator plant list. Uh, Ruth already mentioned that you have a Greeley specific list. And I had uh, Pat Hayworth with uh, uh, Plant Select years ago uh, do a search uh, feature on plant select plants for pollinators. And you can go through and you can find all of the pollinator plants that uh, plant select offers just by putting in the pollinator search word. We have pollinator habitat signs. So if you're participating in life after lawn and uh, you are uh, reducing and eliminating your pesticide use and planting a beautiful native garden for native pollinators, we have signs available for you. Uh, you can also, if you decide you want to kind of take a peek and see what's involved in getting uh, pollinator safe communities put together, we have a guide that's on our website that can help you with that. Even though I am the chair, the people who do all the work are these two ladies here. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are the people who make all the difference on the ground every single day. And uh, these two women uh, deserve kudos for their efforts um, for the organization. And the first of these is Joyce Kennedy and she's our outreach and advocacy coordinator. That woman is busy as a bee uh, and there is her contact information. And then we have Sabina um, and Sabina is our director of communications and development. So if you have a corporate giving program or if you um, know of someone who is offering grants or have some uh, financial wherewithal that you would like uh, to give us a hand with, then Sabina would be the person for that. 
I'm ready to take questions if anybody has any. We don't have any in the queue yet, but um, I would like to ask you, so you had mentioned 76 and how that's kind of a pollinator highway in addition to a highway for us in vehicles. Is there an issue with um, the insects being killed by vehicles? Um, there, of course, can be. Um, but what we find is that pollinator highways are incredibly effective um, because they tend to flow with traffic instead of against traffic if they are properly planted. And the other thing to remember is that most of these uh, native bees really have ranges of about five feet. So they don't even try to cross highways. They're just staying put right where their host species is. And we are working right now on um, trying to get an urban uh, highway project uh, out. And uh, that is uh, the diagonal highway between Longmont and Boulder. So it'd be super cool uh, to get that project done because then people would have an example of it, you know, just right close. It's, it's a pretty good haul to Julesburg. <laughs> okay. Um, I took, I just want to mention that I took this workshop. Oh, I don't know. It's probably been about three years now in Longmont when you did it with uh, Audubon. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I got the pollinator sign to put in my yard because I am also a beekeeper. Um, but just, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with water conservation? Well, I think Beth covered the issue of the pesticides in the water and soil. And by planting a monoculture of turf, we're not providing this habitat for either the honeybees or our 950 species of native bees or the um, butterflies, moths, flies, even wasps are pollinators and bats. You know, bats are vilified and they are some of the best pollinators. So by helping all of these organisms and we're also going to be saving some water along the way. Very much. Okay. What can we, here's a question for you from the queue. What can we look for when purchasing plants? Is there a pollinator safe marking or brand? That is an excellent question. Um, if you go to a reputable local nursery, they will know how their plants have been treated but there is not necessarily going to be a sign that says they are neonicotinoid free. And in fact, uh, there was some, a campaign conducted by a national NGO probably three years ago to get Home Depot and Lowe's in particular to label their plants as containing neonicotinoids. And um, the labeling um, was, was not negative labeling. It was, hey, we use neonicotinoids to you know, combat uh, white flies and, and things that these plants didn't have or won't have in your garden. But it made it sound like if they didn't um, grow them with the use of neonicotinoids, you wouldn't have plants at all. So I guess the best thing I can tell you is that uh, the nurseries have really hopped on the bandwagon because the data is strong um, on the issues that are associated with this class of chemicals. And so uh, I think that if you ask, they will be able to tell you. And I think buying from a grower slash garden center they're going to be able to provide even more information. Someone that actually grows their own product too, instead of shipping them in from California or Washington. Yes, correct. So like I say, if, you, if, you've got, if you've got somebody that's local, that's your baby. And honestly, vote with your dollars. They aren't going to get those plants in unless you ask for them. Don't you think, Beth? Yeah. 
and, and like I say, you, you know, put your money where your mouth is. And, and so definitely, but again, the, there is enough consumer demand driving these products that they are available um, in annuals and perennials in shrubs and in trees at this point, because people, people do know and people are asking and they have already started that process. So you're not gonna be the first to ask. They will have a response for you. If somebody looks at you and has no idea what you just asked them, that is your answer. <laughs> okay, so, so. Uh, and you can't be sure if they, if they can't answer it, you can't be sure. Right. So one of the questions is, does Eaton Grove or Happy Life grow their own? Eaton Grove does grow a lot of their own, probably not all. And Happy Life is a garden center, so they don't grow a bunch of their own. But still, again, ask, because they are, I have seen it on some labels. This is neonic free or whatever. Right. Um, I, I have another question yeah. about beekeeping. Yeah. How do I learn more about beekeeping? And I was oh. thinking it might be a good idea to do um, just an introduction maybe in the fall. And then Northern Colorado Beekeeping Association does a class in um, January, February. It's like three consecutive Saturdays all day. It's a great class. I've taken it twice. But you want to talk more about that, Beth? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, if you want to help native bees, all you have to do is plant native plants, quit using pesticides, and not spend 800 bucks. <laughs> okay. But if you want to spend $800 and help honeybees, to help honeybees and help yourself be successful with honeybees is to take a class. So I um, teach, uh, I have taught Northern Colorado's class uh, for several years. I do not teach it at this time, uh, but they have an excellent instructor that teaches for them uh, now. I teach at the Gardens on Spring Creek. I typically teach not what I would call a course like Northern Colorado offers, but a class and, and several classes for uh, Jacks um, and Murdochs both. Um, and so, so there are ample opportunities to uh, sign up for a beekeeping class and get some great information out of it. Yeah, that first quart of honey is about $800, just like my first dozen eggs was about $1,500. So yes. <laughs> you have to it's a great <laughs> hobby. It is a great hobby. And I can include information. And I would say if you're really interested in beekeeping, get involved with NOCO Bees now. And they do a monthly meeting and you can start learning about some of this. And um, it's really cheap to join. Yeah, and you can remember and, it's uh, 25 or 35 dollars i want to say uh but uh it also gives you a membership into the state beekeeping association and so the local beekeeping clubs will bring in local experts but the state will bring in the national experts for their biannual meetings and so those are kind of cool too so somebody is asking I have been thinking about adding clover to my lawn to help add some pollinator benefits for areas that currently are currently turf. I am also putting in native pollinator friendly plants too, but want to have a little lawn for my kids. Is there a good brand or kind of clover? And I got to scroll. And I guess my question is really whether or not clover is beneficial for native pollinators. Oh yeah. So uh, clover is a uh, huge uh, pollinator uh, plant. It is a really rich nectar source. So I have Dutch clover in my lawn. Um, so it's low growing. And uh, I, it is a cultivated plant, but uh, so I don't really know how it works with native uh, bees, but I do know that it works well for mostly anybody else. Native bees have a tendency to be super specialized. So, so if we talk about things like um, mason bees, you know, mason bees are, are fruit, 
fruit guys. You know, all they do is fruit trees. Okay, and squash bees, all they do is uh, is any squashes. So they're really specialized bees. So I think that you would have uh, more luck with the native plants and the native bees than you would with the Dutch clover. But that the Dutch clover does provide a super, super, um, uh, super rich nectar source for lots of insects. And the nectar is, is a carbohydrate. And, and that's one of their key pieces of their nutritional puzzle. Um, I might want to mention too, Beth talked about this at the beginning, the, the native pollinator bees, native bees, they are solitary and they typically, not the mason bees, but the rest of them typically nest in the ground. So I know we say for conservation, use mulch around your plants, which I still recommend, but make sure you pull it back from the crown of the plants because you don't wanna be rotting your crowns and leave some bare ground for those bees to dig into the ground and make their little burrows because that's where they need to live. And they'll go in the ground and they'll, you know, they'll hibernate in there over the winter and then come back out in the spring. And the other thing about the native bees is they are typically pretty not aggressive. They're pretty docile bees, wouldn't you say? Yeah, so native bees, uh, all these little solitary bees can sting, uh, most of them, but they don't. Um, and so they are ground nesters, you are correct. They also live in plant stems. Um, some of them, um, you know, they have different, uh, the reason mason bees, are, for example, are called mason bees is because they make mud nests. So they're like masons uh, that they work with a little uh, like cement. Um, you have bees that make resin nests. You've got bees that um, there's a, uh, one of my favorite bees is a um, shoot I'll think of it but it it takes the fuzz off of like your uh, any of your plants that are super fuzzy the uh, and they take that fuzz and they make this wad in that and they lay their egg in that in that fuzz so uh, great um, for some bees many of them are gregarious bees so they, uh, they live in big apartment complexes. They don't share raising a brood or anything like that. So they're not a colony insect, but there are lots of them because they like the same places to live. And so they live next to each other all the time. And I'll think of that bee here as soon as we hang up, but it's a really neat one. There's a lot of really neat ones. Um. You said you put Dutch clover in your lawn. Is that what you would consider a micro clover? I've heard that term before. It's a low growing clover. It's way different from the yellow sweet clover and the white sweet clover that grow on the side, roadsides. Um, oh, it's the white flowered one. Mm -hmm, it's white, that white flowered one. So it's not the micro one. Uh, I have seen, you know, there's that whole class. Um, I want to say it's plant select, but maybe not. It's called steppables which are all those really super low growing woolly times and times that you can intercede in between your um, uh, flagstone and, and uh, so that you get all this color and all of these um, the insects that can appreciate uh, those little tiny flowers. One of the most impressive lawns I've ever seen, uh, it was here in Berthid and it was a, a time lawn, T-H-Y-M-E, time. And it was entirely pink. Uh, they, the whole thing was time. And honest to Pete, there was a, uh, a, a, a colony of bees working that time. So yeah, was, those are, that's okay. cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so follow up on that clover question. She read the person who's asking said, I read that you're supposed to aerate or power rake before you overseed clover. Is that okay to do or will that mess with any of the bees that are ground nesting? Uh, no, they're way down below that. So okay. uh, you can quite safely do that. Yeah, I'll, almost all your ground nesters are down probably a foot or so. Um, I have another question. Are bug hotels helpful for pollinators? Oh yeah, they're super cool. <laughs> 
everybody should have a bunk hotel. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, bunk hotels, if you're not familiar with the terminology, is uh, is actually uh, more for these uh, insects that are tube nesters. But you uh, have all these different styles of, of tubes, you know, fat ones and skinny ones and pine cones and and just this whole beautiful range of if you if you type into your search engine bug hotels, you will see an, a fabulous collection of, of bug hotels out there. And uh, they're just offering a variety of materials for these insects to nest in and, and insects are opportunists. So they'll take advantage of them. We have a pretty big one at the Xeriscape Garden that I mentioned before at 2503 Reservoir Road. Um, and the garden itself doesn't look great right now, although the pask flowers are blooming, which is really pretty cool. That's in our monarch garden, the pask flower. But we do have a bug hotel there. And we basically, um, a student started it and we drilled into, um, you know, all this wood that fell from the snowstorm. Use that wood, don't buy lumber, save yourself some money, but also um, the chemicals that might be in lumber you'd probably don't want to put in your bug hotel. There, a lot of them are made out of bamboo. And I, I wonder uh, about how well they function because certainly if you were a native bee, you would not be looking for bamboo for a house. You would be looking for your native woods, okay? And so I think that if you're thinking about purchasing a native bee house, you'd be better off doing exactly what Ruth just said just drilling some holes. This is a great project for kids uh, is to, uh, they love to use power tools, <laughs> but you can do all sorts of different uh, size bits from, from little eighth inch bits all the way up to half inch, three quarter inch bits and all sorts of things will move into all of those different holes. You know, they all have different needs. Uh, but I, they, they are already living here. They're, you know, all you're trying to do is get them where you can uh, check them out and observe them. All right. Well, thank you all for um, participating. Thank you, Ruth, for hosting and inviting. And I will ship you over uh, the uh, presentation here uh, shortly. And I would love to get a group going here in this Greeley. We, we'll start with Greeley and then move out from there. So if anybody's interested in that, um, let me know. Cool. We can, we can give you help. Uh, okay. We would love to. We would love to. The only reason, like I say, we're small but mighty, and it's because of all the help from our friends. <laughs> One thing I'd like to launch at some point is I would like to call them pollinator pockets, where we just uh, maybe provide plants if somebody agrees to like take this little section of this parking lot that's turf and trampled and put in pollinator plants there, you know, and just speckle them throughout town. That's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but just don't have the bandwidth to get done. Oh, sure. It's like the Lavender Lady book, a kid's book, where she would just go along and throw out seeds. You know, we have seed bombs, guerrilla gardening. You hear people talk about that all the time. Uh, but there's actually um, a talk that I give nationally, and it's not that the talk is... is uh, is bad okay but it's it's not a great talk but what is a, accompanying that talk is i i do all of these uh, resource documents with the talks and there is about a 40 page resource document that goes into this talk and that talk is called making the city pretty and it is all of these people who are doing all of these things all over this country to make their city pretty. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Somebody's already doing it. We just need to go chat with them and find out what they're doing and how they got it done. And uh, it's a great concept. It's a great concept. And, and, uh, and I love the idea of taking control of your own city and making it the way you want it to look. You know, one more thing I might ask you before we let everyone go, or if you have to go, go ahead and go. But there was talk at one time about having a registry and you could put um, your house on it if you didn't want, if you wanted to be notified before you get, and it was probably more for beekeepers. 
um, notified if someone was going to be spraying in your neighborhood. Is there anything, is there any traction with that? Uh, that actually exists, but not at the level that you are <coughs> having. So if you are a certified applicator in particular of uh, mosquito control products, okay, um, uh, municipalities contract that work and those contractors uh, have a, an opt out uh, line that you can call or a website that you can access, but it's typically not for beekeepers, but for chemically sensitive individuals. Okay, so, so that does uh, exist out there. And whoever is your contract uh, mosquito uh, control provider in the municipality will have that and will be able to guide you to that. Uh, beekeepers uh, can register on some of them, but it's designed for chemically sensitive people. Okay, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. And just so the audience knows, those people that spray for mosquitoes basically do nothing except spray pesticides in the air because it has to contact the mosquitoes to even do anything. So Right. These uh, adulticiding is really just window dressing. Yeah. The, if you want to try and get mosquitoes, you got to remove standing water and, and uh, larvicide. But adulticiding is, is uh, it's a great way to waste municipal dollars. And make it look like you're doing something. Yeah, and <laughs> and kill bees. Yeah, we had a I had a really super interesting uh, swarm. Oh, in Loveland, not last year, the year before, where this uh, swarm landed on their deck support post, and actually they'd had a swarm there a few years previously. So they called me, and so I went up there, and we're vacuuming up all these bees to take them, and I start looking around. And they're all dying. And they had um, uh, had a, uh, a lawn, you know, home pest service company that had sprayed those deck support pillars eight days previously, and they were still that toxic. Wow. Yeah, it was super sad. It was super sad. And we did lose the queen and everything out of it. It was a bummer. Uh, but um, you know, we have a lot of education to do. Well, and it is heartbreaking. I've gone out to my hive and they're all dead. And I, I know it was the mosquito sprayers. I know it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough, tough thing, but that's all right. We're all working on it. We, we take our wins and our victories where we can get them. All right. On that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, we can band together. We can do something. Yeah, um, yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming and especially you, Beth, for spending your evening with us. We appreciate it. It was a small group, but an engaged group. So thanks a lot, everyone. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.